Good evening. Welcome back. We're ready to get started again for our last evening program. Thank you so much for coming out. I know it's going to be chilly again, but I think we're more prepared tonight. Um, as far as announcements go, the main thing left is uh, that we have our famous burger sale after this meeting that is benefiting Ozark Adventist School STEAM team, their robotics team. Um, they do some really neat work with those kids and they do trips to Texas and if they qualify in Texas they get to go on to a big competition in Orlando and so they've got lots of fun things that they need to fundraise for. So that's what that um, burger sale is benefiting tonight. And then we will also be selling all of the, not the ferns, but all the mums and the pumpkins and decorations. Um, a lot of that will go back to the tent and uh, to the food tent and you can purchase that there in the back of the food tent. Master's Voice will also have an area set up over in the food tent that you can purchase their items there that they have for sale and talk with them. Um, how about this one? Okay, that better? Um, after this is over, if you would mind just grabbing a couple chairs and setting them, uh, we'll just make stacks against the posts. That would be very helpful to us. And then we'll also pull a couple of these heaters over to the food tent and warm that up a little bit as well. I think that's all I have. Welcome in, and let's uh, get ready for some singing. We're going to sing a couple songs that we know that you know. I think we're going to start with Do Lord. I've got a home in glory, land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory, land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory, land that outshines Savior, you take him to way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. You know, I've heard it said a couple times this weekend about how much fun camp meetings are, but what it will be like when we all get to heaven, our next song. Yeah, let's stand up. Sing better when you're standing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing it.
you may be seated. church right here. I don't know about you. I hear a song breaking through. It's a real good day to love on Jesus. Let the praises flow. Let him know that you know that you know. It's a real Yeah. 
Once again, thank y'all for letting us come. It's been a blessing for us. This song last year won Song of the Year. It's not because we sing it. It's because it grips people on their worst day. The day that they lose someone that they love. We know something about that. I, I buried my little girl. And then 18 months later, my son. And grief has a way of changing you, doesn't it? You're just not the same after something like that. I have some friends that don't know the Lord. And when they lose someone they love, they grieve very differently than we do. I see them running to drugs and alcohol, and I don't blame them. Think about it, church. If you couldn't run to the Lord, hey, if you were to somehow convince me tonight that I would never see my kids again, I would be trying to find a bar somewhere. But I don't have to grieve like those without hope. I get to run to a holy God who says that his grace is enough and I am going to see them again. Now, if that does not comfort your hurting heart, then this song is for you. It does this daddy heart of mine good. To know that right now, my loved ones are in the hands of the only one who could ever love them more than I do. Listen. Even though I can't see you, I'm not worried Cause I'm assured we'll meet again And I know exactly where you are, yes And I know whose hands you're in So many chapters in our story and I believe that this is not the end. We'll pick up where we left off in glory. And I know whose hands you're in. Yes, I know whose hands you're in. So I wonder what it's like to live with Jesus. To finally be at home with Him. To look into the eyes of your Redeemer. Until then, 
Yes, I know who stands your Thank God I know who's at your end. Your daddy knows who's at your This next song we're going to sing, y'all, it kind of took on a new meaning for me at least. Uh, I'd say about five years ago, we were in Dyersburg, Tennessee on a Saturday evening. And there was a, a van full of young women from a troubled girl's home that came to the concert that night. And they sat in that back left corner of the sanctuary. We were so glad they were there. They listened attentively to the concert. And then when it came time to respond to the message, a handful of them came down. One of them, I'll never forget her. Her name was Jessica. Jessica was crying before she got to me. And I'm, you'll never cry alone in my presence. So we're both crying and I don't even know what for yet. She takes both of my hands. She looks up at me and she says, Preacher, I need to be saved. And I thought to myself, well, this is the easiest one of my career. But then she said, but I can't. And I listened as this young lady told me a little about who she was and where she'd been. She said, I'm no good. God wouldn't save someone like me. She said, I'm an addict. She said, my family doesn't even want me around. If you would see my arms, I'd be so embarrassed. So like any preacher would, I started to argue with her. And she said, no, listen, you don't know me. She said, I've been raped so many times, I've lost count. I said, Jessica, how old are you? She said, I'm 19. She looked up with those tear-filled eyes and she said, God wouldn't save someone like me, would he? And I believe the Holy Spirit brought me the only appropriate answer. And I looked at her and I said, Jessica, you are exactly who God came to save. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we somehow begin to think that God had to reach a little farther for someone else than he did for us. Let me tell you something. If you knew my worst 10 minutes, you would have not allowed me on your platform tonight. So maybe you're here. Maybe it's either you or someone that you love. You have put someone in that category of they'll never be saved. They could never be reached. You say, Ricky, what would you say to someone then that thought they were unreachable? What would you say if someone thought they were unlovable, that they'd done so many things that God would never, ever save them? Tell me, sir, what would you think What would you say if someone thought they were unsavable? I want you to hear God's response to those questions. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter your station in life or how long you've been a church member, your eternity could be at stake tonight. Listen. What do you say to someone who feels like they've lost it all? Over the edge with nobody there to break their fall And what do you say to someone who feels so unloved They're giving themselves away a little bit every day just to be good enough And what do you say to a hopeless soul 
who can't remember their way home. Everything is out of their control. There is no valley. There is no darkness. There is no sorrow greater than the grace of Jesus. There is no moment. There is no distance. There is no heartbreak. He can't take you through. So before you think that you're too on the line and they're unsure what happens after their last breath and time and what do you say to someone who's only known abuse and the walls they build to save themselves make it hard to hear the truth and what do you say to a life of regret they're trying so hard to forget what do you say to dreams unmet there is no valley there is no darkness there is no sorrow greater than the grace of jesus there is no moment there is no I'm not sure how we, uh, how do I carry on after some music like that? I just don't know how to do it, really. I'm trying to think of the words to speak after some of those testimonies, that young girl. And I have no doubt that there, there has to be somebody here today that may be struggling with something like that as well. I think we all, at some point in time, we've all had to walk through some form of a valley. I always like to call it somewhere between the hell and the hallelujah. I'm supposed to pray right now. And I don't know what to pray for. The music to me, spoke everything. Those testimonies, we could close the house out tonight. 
with that. There's nothing I can say. But I will ask, have you been blessed tonight? You've been blessed this week too, haven't you? So if I ask you to raise your hand, I bet somebody out there could raise their hand and say, they can praise the name of Jesus. Is that right? Amen. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Earlier today, we got news that uh, Steve Stecker had an accident, automobile accident. It sounded pretty severe, and it is very severe, but we were even worried for his life at one point this morning. Um, his sternum was a big concern. His sternum sounds like everything's fine there. And... Uh, in the morning, he goes in for hip surgery. Sounds like he's recovering, um, but we'll keep you posted abreast of that situation. Um, and I'm sure there's some unspoken requests out there that need to be lifted up. We all have them. We all have lives and families and kids. There's always room for another prayer. To the gentleman that sang here tonight, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Father God, We thank you for coming here tonight and spending some, some more of your precious time with your children. I don't know what you're going to do tonight because your messenger that you sent to us has hit a home run. I don't know how far he's going to hit it tonight. I don't know what you have in store for him. I don't know what you have in store for us, but I think I can say for everyone here tonight, we're anxious to see what you got. Father, I expect nothing but the less, that you'll pierce our hearts. You'll bring us out of our seats tonight. We'll praise our Lord and Savior. And Father, as far as these unspoken requests, I pray that you'll handle them appropriately. Take care of Steve as he's struggling in the hospital. And upon my church family here tonight, I pray special blessing upon each and every one of us. Keep a hedge of protection around us. Bring us back again, Father. Is our prayers here tonight. Amen. Well, I got to turn faces here because I got to do, uh, I got to welcome our, our good brother up here tonight. Uh, you know, everybody that's come up here to uh, welcome Pastor Keith up here, they've all known Pastor Keith. They've all had some kind of great story to tell. It's been very interesting. So I, I got to kind of figuring out, okay, what am I going to say? So I, I started, ha I, I had to kind of dig a little deep. I had to make a little phone call. So I made a little phone call to Mama Gray. <laughs> Just to see what, uh, see what I could come up with. Oh, boy. But she said not to say it up here, so you have to meet me in the tent. <laughs> oh, mercy. Pastor Keith, I just want to tell you how blessed we all are to have you here. You've, uh, what you've done here these past three nights has just been amazing. You're the messenger we needed to hear this week, and we praise Jesus for that. I welcome you up here, sir. With great honor.
Only one thing you can say after an introduction like that. A proverb that you can't find in the scriptures goes a little something like this in the King James. He that hath the microphone last laugheth much. <laughs> Don't look for that text. You're not going to find it. It's in the Apocrypha. <laughs> Again, Lord, we're here. We ask that your spirit would be in our midst. Every time you have filled our cup and we have the nerve to bring you an empty cup for you to fill one more time. I have the nerve to be the empty vessel which, with which you will use. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have wrestled back and forth about what it is I should do with this last time together. And it's, it's funny, the Holy Spirit never wrestles with me. He just says what he's going to say. Leaves it hanging, lets me go, yeah, but if I did this, I could come from this angle and I could leave. Well, what about... And, and then re-emphasizes, re-emphasizes, and I don't know why I fight, he always wins. So this, this evening, to finish us off, I, I want to remind you of some of the things that you learned about God's grace. We learned that God expects a return on the investment that he puts in us of his power. I want to talk, now that you've accepted and received God's grace, we want to talk a little bit about the return on investment. Now, I need you to keep listening until I can get it because, as always, I'm going to take a passage of scripture you're familiar with and maybe show you some things you didn't see in there. So don't quit listening. Till I finish speaking, please turn with me to a familiar passage of scripture, Luke chapter 10. Just for a point of emphasis as we begin to get started, I, 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 I want to settle on verse 29 and following, verse 29 and following, Luke Chapter 10, verse 29, and the Bible reads, But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day... When he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you need, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy 
on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The title of my message for the time that we have left this evening is the specialist, the specialist. It's a problem having Jesus in the neighborhood when you are a religious leader. It's a problem having Jesus show up. It's probably a problem having Jesus even as a child in your Sabbath school class. Can you imagine trying to teach the children about Moses and Jesus raises his little hand and says, well, actually, that's not quite how it happened. <laughs> Jesus was that kind of kid. He, he grew up just giving you fits. And, and he was always loving and he was always kind and he was always respectful. But he always knew more than you wanted him to know. You remember when he was 12 years old and he wandered in as the professors at Southwestern were, were debating scripture and he wandered in to the theology department and began asking them questions about the Messiah. And they looked down at him and said, well, little boy, the Messiah is going to be great. And the Messiah is going to set us free from the captive of the Romans. And then he began quoting to them scriptures like he was bruised for our transgressions. Can you imagine dealing with this kid as he begins to open up scriptures that you thought you knew and smacking you with them? I can imagine they looked at this boy, this precocious child, and they asked a question that most adults ask to precocious children. Little boy, how old are you anyway? I can see Jesus raise one eyebrow and says, that depends. <laughs> On my mama's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, before the earth was formed, I am. Oh, Jesus can be problems. Jesus can give you fits. Imagine what it would feel like. I'm setting this up so that you understand how this individual gets to Jesus. Imagine what it would feel like if it's your Sabbath to preach at cowboy camp meetings. You sent out bulletins and flyers, told all your friends to come. Everybody promised to be there. You get up on Sabbath morning, and there's nobody in the audience except your mama. You stand up. Mama, where is everybody? And mama said, well, child... Last night, somebody heard that Jesus was preaching down by the river, so they all went to go hear him. Well, at least my mama came to support me. And mama says, oh no, child, I I'm going over to hear Jesus too. I just wanted to know if you wanted a ride. <laughs> Jesus was a problem. And every time they would come and try and approach him, every time they would push up on him, he would always do the exact same thing. He'd sigh, he'd lift his head and say, a story is told. And he'd tell one of those parables that would put you in a mess. By the end of the parable, you were telling on yourself and everybody knew it. So finally, they decided we need to call in a professional, a specialist. We need to call in an attorney that is without peer, 
We need to call in someone who has spent their lives debating scripture and knows it left and right, and they called in the specialist. He was a Jewish rabbi of rabbis. He was a professional. He, he, he could break down your Sabbath school lesson 15 different ways. And they gave him a call and said, look, Jesus is going to be in town. We need you to put him in his place. He said, I've been wanting to have a chat with Jesus anyway. I'll take the case. He said, look, 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 man. There's one thing you need to be concerned about. You need to be worried. If he starts, there's something that he does that always trips us up. If he starts, I want to warn you ahead of time, you got to veer away. Listen, 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 he said. If you knew what was best, you would have done it yourself. You called me, let me do what I do. Yeah, I, I, I just want to warn you. When you go in front of Jesus, he's not like any, I, I got this. After all, I'm the specialist. So he found Jesus, breaking down the word of God. He sat and listened for a while. And if a thief can be warmed by the words that come out of Jesus' mouth, you'd better believe the specialist's heart was turned as well. By the time Jesus broke for a little bit to give him a word to come in edgewise that we find here in Luke chapter 10, he was genuinely wanting to hear the answer to the question he was posing. So now, we got to go through the scripture here. By the way, I know that this is one of the first stories you've ever heard. So there's little meat on these bones. Or is there? Keep listening. We're going to go verse by verse here. We started off with a parable of Jesus and opening it up. We're going to close this thing off with a parable of Jesus and opening it up. Are you ready? Here we go. The man rolls up to Jesus, and verse 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, remember he's got to have that dialect, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to hear that question again. Read it in your Bible. Teacher, what must I do? To inherit eternal life. Did you hear the problem with the question? No? Let me shorten it for you. What must I do to inherit? Jesus could have shut this thing down and Luke Chapter 10 would have been much shorter if Jesus decided he just wanted to lean on that. He could have looked at the attorney and said, you're asking the wrong question. Because if you know anything about an inheritance, an inheritance is not about what you did. An inheritance happens because of who you know. Oh, Jesus could have shut him down right then and there and said, you're asking the wrong question. The problem that you have is you keep trying to do something to inherit, and inheriting is about relationship and not about the deeds you've done. I wish there were some people who would Get on that train. When the train came early and the children were watching, who's getting into heaven? I wish we had folks who would not get in line and quote their spiritual resume as to why they deserve to be in heaven. They are like the attorney who thinks, if I do enough, I'll make it in. And it's not about what you do. It's all about who you do it with and who you do it for. 
shut him down. Jesus looked into his heart and mind, decided a different approach. Jesus paused and said, what's in the law? How do you read it? Now, this is a specialist. He's an attorney. He's an attorney in the law of God. Can you imagine that? He's got his jurisprudence in Scripture. Some of these guys were so awesome, they could quote the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, from memory. And they do it backwards. Forward is, I know how to start at Genesis and go forward. Backwards is, you tell me the text and I'll tell you where it's found. This brother is awesome. And when Jesus asks him, what is written in the law? How do you understand it? I love his answer. Verse 27, so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Stop, stop right there. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up going to Pathfinders. And I remember when they told us in order to get the next patch up, you're going to have to remember the Ten Commandments. You're going to have to be able to quote the Ten Commandments. And they made me quote the Ten Commandments so that I could move on from friend to companion. Nobody ever told me there was a cheat sheet. Come on, this dude knows the Ten Commandments. But notice what he says. I wish I could go back and do Pathfinders over. Because I would have rolled up when they said, Keith, come, commandments. I would have rolled up and said, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Finish, ha-ha, ta-ta. What in the world? How could that be the Ten Commandments? Come on, they even skipped our favorite. Come on, now you know, if you've been around in Adventist church for about five minutes, you know what our favorite is, don't you? You know what the favorite is. You can quote it right now if I let you. It starts off with remember. Come on, folks, remember the Sabbath day. To what? And we can keep going from there, can't we? Six days shall thy labor. Remember we used to quote that all the way through? Every Sabbath? We have the nerve to even call it. Listen, our affirmation of faith. <laughs> like the Sabbath saved you. He doesn't even quote that one. How does he get away with this? we got to understand this thing. How does he get away with it? And here's the thing that bothers me. Not only does he not say all ten of the commandments, but afterwards, Jesus says, you have answered rightly. Okay, I'm shook. I'm shook. How did... How did that happen? Called summarization. If you look at the law of God, it's divided into two categories. Love to God, your vertical relationship, and love to mankind, your horizontal relationship. What the lawyer did and what Jesus praised was the fact that he understood the law is about God's love. I thought I'd get an amen. Amen, lights. The law is about God's love. The first four commandments govern how I show love to God Almighty. 
Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the last six commandments govern how I show love to my fellow man and your neighbor as yourself. That one, praise the Lord. And, and this is the sum total. The brother got it right. The brother was deeper than many of us because many of us have found a way to keep all ten of God's commandments and show no love whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I want to swing around that spot that says, and your neighbor as yourself. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yes, we ought to love our neighbor. But if I haven't learned to love myself, I can't love my neighbor right. Oh my goodness. That shakes you up because you've always been told, love everybody else, but crucify yourself. I am nothing but a worm. I don't know why God wants anything to do with me. And here's the problem. The way that I consider myself is the way that I treat my neighbors. This is the reason. It's not in my notes. This is free. This is the reason that if you're going to fix a home where there's abuse, you can't fix it by beating up the abuser. Oh, we got to do something, but that's not going to fix it. Why? Because he can't love himself. Any abuser I've ever run into is someone who has a problem not just loving those he hurts. He hurts because he has a problem loving himself. And your neighbor as yourself. That's what this brother quoted. Jesus looked at him. He stood there very proud, trying to see what Jesus would say next. Jesus said, that's exactly right. But the clue is that Jesus comes and says, go do this and you'll be all right. See, here in the Greek, the go do this, the Greek is real specific. That's why everybody understood what Jesus actually meant. And we don't, because it doesn't translate into English that well. The go do this actually means go start doing this. Which means Jesus correctly read his heart and said, you know a bunch of facts, but you have not started to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you have not begun to love your neighbor as yourself. As soon as you begin, inheritance is yours. Oh, you can imagine what the people said when Jesus said that. The specialist <laughs> stands there waiting, and Jesus says, go well, start what you said you could do, and you ain't got no problems. And everybody went, ooh. That's why the next passage says, but he wanting to justify himself, he's been embarrassed now. All of the folks that he said, I'm the specialist, I got this, they're watching him. So he's got to recover. And he asks, so who is my neighbor? That was a question that everybody was asking. The Jews wanted to know, how far do I have to go in order for God to accept the fact that I have checked off, I love my neighbor? 
They argued about it. They discussed it, and they had never come to a conclusion. And now he dumps this off on Jesus. And Jesus stands, tilts his head up, and all the other Pharisees said, oh, no, here he goes. Puts his hand on his chin and says, a story is told. And all the Pharisees were like, abort, abort, abort. This is what we were talking about. No, run. Don't hear that parable. You're going to mess yourself up. A story is told. And the specialist hung in to hear the story. Check me. It was over as soon as he sat down to listen. And it's over for us as well. Let's hear it with new eyes. Because we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to go through this and go through it again. I'm going to bring you verse by verse, and we're going to understand this thing and break it down to its core level. Remember, a parable is the way Jesus tries to help us understand the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So we need to understand this passage, not just as the story, but as the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. All right, it's time to go to school. How is this the kingdom of heaven? I'm going to help you with this one piece. Put this one piece into the puzzle, and the rest of it you'll begin to see. Are you listening? Yeah. Here it goes. The man coming from Jerusalem down to Jericho represents all of mankind. See, he works in Jerusalem but he lives in Jericho. And if you go to Israel this day, that road is a winding road through the mountains, and it's dangerous to, draw, to go down that way by yourself. Yet he's walking on his own, and the Bible says that he fell in among thieves. They had been waiting in ambush, and he was the perfect target and the thieves jumped out, they beat him, they stripped him of everything he had, and they left him for dead. I told you, this is mankind. What happened to mankind? On his way to the inheritance that God had created, on his way to being Lord of all that God had given him, on his way from the very presence of God, Adam fell in amongst a thief. What did the thief do? Stripped him. You remember how Adam left the garden? If it wasn't for God having community service at the edge of Eden, Adam would have left how? Stripped naked. Are you beginning to see it now? Beaten down and bruised. And here's the thing. He doesn't kill him. He leaves him to die. Are you understanding? The wages of sin was death, but Satan was not allowed to kill Adam just beat him, just bruise him, and leave him, eventually sin will do the job. Are you seeing it now? Left him there to die. All of mankind finds themselves in this exact same condition. All of us are side of the road having been stripped of everything that belonged to us and left 
waiting to die. The thief goes back to where he's hiding, looking for the next victim that happens to walk down the road, having in his hand everything that Adam owns. Bible says, now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, passed on the other side. Y'all have seen that priest, haven't you? So heavenly minded that there are no earthly good whatsoever. I want you to notice this man is gurgling in his own blood, and as the priest comes walking by, the man, mankind, cries out, help me, help me, help me. But the priest is one who does not have time for mankind. I'm too busy doing the Lord's work. He's just come from worship service in Jerusalem and he's walking by filled with the glory of the Lord and he sees the problems that mankind is dealing with. But those problems aren't his problem. Can I step a little closer to you? Can I agitate you just a little bit? I've been an Adventist a long time. And I understand how many of us find ourselves in this situation. I, I, I spent a large portion of my life in, in Southwest Union's holy city. Y'all know where that is, don't you? Come on, that's King. That's where even the gas station attendants are going to glory. Come on now, I grew up during the time living in Keene where you could not get gas after sundown on Sabbath till sundown Saturday night. I grew up going to Keene when you could not buy meat in the city limits. It's the holy city. I remember being a pastor there, and I remember one of my, my parents coming to me about their young person and said, oh, pastor, you've got to do something. You've got to talk to our son. He respects you, and you've got to talk to our son. He's going astray. I said, what do you mean he's going astray? Said, well, we've done everything that we can to make sure that he lives a righteous life, but he's going astray, and we can't understand it. And I said, what do you mean you've done everything? They said, well, our children don't know anybody who's not interested. We put him in an environment where he's in church school all of his life. Uh-oh. We put him in an environment where all of the neighbors are, 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 are people who know Jesus Christ. We can't figure out what's wrong. And suddenly I remembered what my, my professor told me while I was at Southwestern, and he said something. He said, when you graduate, it's not your job to stay here. Your job is to go out. Your job is not to live a life where you, like the priest, don't look at anything that might be disturbing. Your job is to be out where you can touch hands with everybody else. He said something, and this might make you a little bit upset. And if you're upset, it's okay. I don't mind. I'm going home in the morning. He said, Christians are like manure. 
He said, if you spread it across the lawn, it makes the grass grow green and rich. Pile it all together and we stink. Chew on that one on your way back home. When we're piled all together, thinking about nothing but our issues, thinking about nothing but our problems, we walk past mankind and pretend that he doesn't exist. Why? Because we're waiting on the coming of the Lord. Amen, lights. He walks by on the other side, still humming songs from, from church. Being a Seventh-day Adventist has its own subculture. Oh, I'm going, I'm going to really mess with y'all tonight. It has its own subculture. We have a language that nobody else understands. There are key words that all Adventists know that let you know you're with an Adventist. You know those key words. Happy Sabbath. Come on now, Jewish folk don't say Happy Sabbath. They say Shabbat Shalom. If you walk on somebody and you say Happy Sabbath, and they look at you, you know, aha. Here's another one, it's a catchphrase. If you walk up on somebody and said, Worthington food, I would say Morning Star, but there's some folks out there that have gotten hip to Morning Star. I go to the grocery store, I can't even find my breakfast patties no more because there, there are some folks who ain't supposed to know about that that have got it in their carts. And as a good Seventh-day Adventist, the reason why I know they ain't supposed to know is that's another thing that lets you know you're in with an Adventist. When we go to the grocery store and we run into other Adventists in the grocery store, isn't it interesting how we like to look inside the cart to make sure that they have a kosher? You know how you do? Oh, it's good to see you. Because you know... If there's anything from the meat market, we're looking sideways at you. Mm. You still haven't torn yourself away from your terrish diet, I see. We can get so closed in that the rest of the world doesn't exist. That's what's meant by the priest who walks by on the other side. The Word of God says that there's another representative from the church. He's not a full priest. He's just a Levite. This is an elder. This is a teacher. Maybe he was the Pathfinder leader. This is a lay person. And the Bible says as he gets to where this man is, he does something a little different. It's he goes over to look. Why does he go over to look? Mm. You know, it's that accident on the side of the road thing. Yeah, but it's deeper than that. My favorite author, my aunt, in her book, Desire of Ages, you know we call her Auntie Ellen. Come on now. Here's what she had to say. She said, he goes over to look because it would be wrong if this guy is a Jew for me to walk past him. But if he's not a Jew, then I can walk by in peace. He goes over to check and see if this guy looks like me, maybe I ought to give him a hand. But because there's so much blood, he can't tell if this dude is the right color. Lord have mercy. 
Are you nervous? We're still talking about grace. There's another issue that's there. He only thinks of his neighbor as being somebody who's like him. I'm only going to give to someone who's like me. You get to decide what like me is. Is it the same color as I am? Is it the same economic status as I am? Or is it the same denomination as I am? And he's content with moving to the other side because if you're not like me, you probably deserve to be where you are. Are you listening to me, church family? He walks by on the other side. Here's the problem. It is a Jew. And he still walks by on the other side because at the end of the day, I will make excuses about why I don't help someone who's in trouble. You know those homeless people? Y'all don't have them because the homeless people don't come this far out into the, into the mountains. They all run down to Dallas-Fort Worth. Pull up at the light, and they've got that little sign saying, We'll work for food, and you don't want to give them any money. They're just going to waste it on drugs, aren't they? After all, he's got two legs, got two arms, needs to pull himself up by his own boot straps. And we walk by on the other side. Still talking about grace. Pastor, you started, you quit. My mother would say it this way. Pastor, you quit preaching and started meddling now. This ain't about no grace. You're talking about a social agenda. No, you need to understand. The gospel at its core is about helping the lost. That's the social agenda. That's it. I am helping the lost. Shoot, I didn't just walk away from the man. I left him an amazing facts track. James says he gives more grace more grace. You know the more grace means more than what it is you need. More power than what it is you need. Why? Because I'm supposed to help others with the overflow of what God gives. And God is expecting a return on that investment. He walks by on the other side. Is there anybody who's going to actually reach out and grab mankind? The Bible says, then a certain Samaritan came. <laughs> this is kingdom language. Who do you think the Samaritan is? Let me tell you who it's not. The Samaritan is not a good Christian. All apologize, all apologies to Samaritan's purse. Samaritan cannot be a good Christian. He's our example, but he's not the good Christian. Why? Because Jesus, when he's doing a parable about the kingdom, never puts the good guy as a good Christian. He is always the example. He represents the Samaritan. Oh, pastor, now you've gone too far. There's no way that Jesus would be the Samaritan. You thought about it? Samaritans were Jewish folk who were ostracized by their own kind, 
until they lived on the outskirts and they were never accepted in Jewish society. What they got to do with Jesus? Oh, you forgot what John said about Jesus when he got here. He came unto his own and his own what? Received him not. Here's how I know the Samaritan is Jesus. He's on his way, coming down from Jerusalem, the holy city. And here's how I know he's Jesus. Out of all the people who have passed by, he's the only one with a donkey. Everybody else walked by on the other side. Are you, are you listening to the text? Do you see it? But the Bible says when he finds the man, he not only comes down and helps, but he does what? He puts him on his own donkey. Now, here's the thing about the donkey. For you, a donkey is a horse that's light. But for a Jew, a donkey was a royal animal. When David came in victorious, he didn't ride on a horse. He rode on a donkey. When David was going to make Solomon the next king, he didn't put Solomon on a horse. He put him on a donkey. And later, when Jesus did his triumphal entry as the son of David, he doesn't ride in on a horse. He rides in on a what? The only person wealthy enough to have a donkey is the Samaritan in the story. Not only does he have a donkey, he's got oil, he's got wine, he's got stuff and provisions. So get the picture. See Jesus coming down after being rejected in Jerusalem. He's coming down looking at mankind. And the Bible says he gets off his royal steed. It's down where mankind is. And he begins to help him. Now here's the part. Here's the part nobody preaches. So the next time you preach, preach this part in there. Freely I have received, freely I give. No copyrights on the gospel. If there's anybody who deserves or has something that the thief would want, it would be this dude. But do you notice, when this man comes by himself, the thief does not come out to rob him. You know why? Because even the thief knows better than to mess with the man on the donkey. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Thieves ain't gonna mess with the king. See him as he comes down and, and he looks there and then there's this. Jesus says he doesn't just stop. He just doesn't just care. He cleans his wounds with two things. What are they? You know the text. Oil and what? Wine. You remember what wine represents? Wine represents his blood. This is my body. This is my blood. How does Jesus clean mankind? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But not just the blood. He uses oil. What's oil in Scripture? The Holy Ghost. Oh, my goodness. See Jesus come down to where mankind is, get down where we are, and fill us with his blood and cleanse us with his blood and fill us with the Holy Ghost. 
Where are the good Christians? I'm so glad you asked. Jesus picks the man up, puts him on the donkey. Don't miss that. He walks where we walked and put us where he belongs. And where does he take mankind? To the inn. To the innkeeper. What's the innkeeper? That. Where does God bring mankind when mankind is bruised and broken? What is the entity that he alone will trust broken and battered mankind with? Bring town. It's us. It's us. He brings him in. What is the spot where mankind can convalesce and get better? It's supposed to be us. Where can I come and I'm not perfect, I'm beaten, I'm broken, and my feet are broken, but I can still sit at the welcome table. That's supposed to be us. He cares for them there. Is there room for Jesus to care for folks who have been beaten down by Satan at your church? Here's the part that disturbs me and excites me all at the same time. Skip down, skip down, verse 35. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again I will repay you. That's the kingdom language. That's the overflow. Because you don't go to the inn without paying for the time that you're there. So he pays for the time that he's there. But then he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Here's a couple of extra. Here's a couple of extra gifts. Here's a couple of extra talents. Here's what it's for. I'm giving you more grace. I'm giving you more blessings. I'm giving you more than what you need in order to keep food on the table. I've blessed you with more than that. I've blessed you with enough so that you have more than one coat when it gets cold. I've blessed you with enough so that you have this beautiful piece of property. I've blessed you with enough so that you have a higher standing. Don't think that God blessed you with all of that so that you could pour the excess on yourself. Why has God blessed us so much? He has blessed us with extra that we might take care of the needs of mankind. Here, I'm giving you extra. Thank you for returning a faithful tithe. I'm going to bless you. But that blessing isn't so you buy an extra Lexus just in case. It's so that you take care of mankind that I placed in your reach. Did you hear the language? Did you hear it? He says, I'm going to bless you with more. And just in case what I blessed you with runs out and you got to dip into your own Starbucks money. 
just in case what I blessed you with runs out and you got to dip into your own time and you got to dip into your own energies, guess what he says? I'm going away right now, but when I come back, what's that in the kingdom? That, my brothers and sisters, is the second coming of Christ. When I come back, if you've spent more than I gave, I will reward you. That is what he's coming back to check us for. Y'all don't believe me, do you? Go back to Matthew when he separates the sheep from the goats, and he looks at the sheep and he says, well done. Why well done? Because I was sick. Took care of me. I was in prison. Stopped by and visited me. I was in need, and you clothed me. And the response of the righteous is, we've done this so much that we don't even remember when we did it. When did we take care of you? And he says, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it. We've heard a lot of grace. It's changed my mind. It's changed my perspective. Now, will it change my trajectory when it comes to ministry? God did not save you simply for you to get into glory by yourself. You have been saved that you might serve. And lights. Grace requires a return on the investment. Ah, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you how to use what God has given you. I just want to let you know if you can sit here, you have been blessed by God and he's looking for a return on the investment. If you love him, if you love him, feed my sheep, take care of my lamb. It's got to happen after you leave this high, hollowed place. It's got to take place. Because mankind is still sitting right where we passed him. They will know that we have the love of Jesus Christ within us. And that love bubbles over onto others. Somebody under the sound of my voice, this is not simply the command of God. This is how to fix what's wrong. See, I found out something. When I'm engaged in trying to take care of the needs of other folk, I have a tendency not to dwell on my own issues all that much. When the church is taking care of the needs of everybody else, we stop fighting about what color the carpet ought to be in the sanctuary. We stop fighting about who should be in office after constituency. 
Help me, Holy Ghost. We start sounding like Nehemiah when the debaters want us to come down. We say, I'm doing a good work. I ain't got time to come down and play with you. May Christ find us so doing when he comes back to get us. Close with this. Somebody's going to ask the question. Where does prophecy fit in with all of this? I just thought if I understood the 2300-day prophecy, then I'm doing pretty well. Jesus says, that's nice. That's not what I'm after. It's great that you know. It's great that you know. Apply it to your life. But I want to be caught doing the work of God. Not just quoting lines and charts. On the door of one of my favorite professors at Southwestern, he had a cartoon. And on the door, it was a cartoon of somebody in a classroom pointing out the charts when the clothes happened and the children of Israel were sent back to Jerusalem and when the final call came and when the Messiah was cut off and he's going through and he's pointing on the chart and he's talking about when Jesus would come and outside his window there are angels and the second coming is already happening and he's got his Pointer still pointing and he's looking at the, out the window and he's saying, you're early. <laughs> let us, hear me church, let us be found doing the work of God. Not because we're trying to get into heaven, but because we're in the family. And that's the family business. Our heads for prayer. Father God, I thank you for the time that we've been able to spend. Lord, your grace is sweet. Your grace is amazing. Your grace saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Now, Lord, now that we're in the family, Help us to fulfill the family business. Help us not to be afraid to get our hands dirty in the mess of mankind that we might show when you return we are worthy of the reward that you will give. Each heart, each mind in this place. Lord, I don't know if I ever get an opportunity again to be here Maybe after this message, they might think twice. <laughs> Lord, one of these days, Lord, whether it's soon or far away, my last prayer is that I will get a chance to see my brothers and sisters here again. Lord, let it be around that table where we can sit next to Mephibosheth in those white robes of righteousness. Lord, let it be underneath that tree that bears 12 different kinds of fruit. Lord, you know heaven's going to be a big place and we're going to be looking for folks like we look for people at camp meeting. So Lord, you know you and I have already talked and I want to let the people here at Springstown know exactly where they can find Pastor Gray when they get to glory. You and I have already talked, and I've discussed it, and I believe that one of those fruits on that tree that bears seven different kinds of fruit is going to be mango. Lord, when the good saints here that get to glory are looking for me, 
may they find me underneath the branch that bears the mango. Father, let us be reunited there. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Seal us with that grace to that end. Make us alive to Christ and dead indeed to sin. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Thank you all for letting us be here with you. It's been a pleasure. I hope we see you again one day. Trouble, strife, and raging war. Sin abounding more and more. We all know this world won't last that much longer. On the pages of God's word. What's foretold, we've seen and heard. We rejoice because we know we don't belong here. Oh, the trumpets go to sound, the dead in Christ will leave the ground. Hallelujah, we shall rise to meet him in the clouds. Eyes upon the skies, it's almost time to say goodbye. It's going to be the last of the last days in it. see the signs it's the ending of all time we are living final chapters of the story let's proclaim it far and near child of god be of good cheer very soon he's coming back with a shout of glory oh the trumpet's gonna sound the dead in christ will leave the ground hallelujah we shall rise to meet him The last of the last days any day now. He's coming soon. It may be morning, night, or noon. It won't be church. Church. It won't be long till we sing redemption song. Sing redemption song of the trumpet. It's gonna sound the dead in Christ. We'll lead the ground. Hallelujah, we shall rise to meet him in the cloud. the last of the last days. We're living in the last of the last